The Sega Saturn has a wonderful list of role-playing games. While not many made their way west compared to the PlayStation, what it did have was varied and well-received. I really enjoyed Shining the Holy Ark, a first-person JRPG that kind of puts you in the mind of Fantasy Star's battle system. I also thought Shining Force 3 was a great turn-based strategy RPG. It had a great graphics engine, and I loved the soundtrack. Even the action-adventure Magic Knight Ray Earth was a treat, combining a gorgeous visual aesthetic with Zelda-like combat. Many of you thought Panzer Dragoon Saga was one of the best role-playing games of that generation. It was a mix of traditional RPG elements as well as a battle system that allowed you to strategically position yourself for more efficient combat. When it comes to a favorite, that game for me has to be Dragon Force. It was a real-time strategy RPG that took a number of cues from various popular games in the genre and combined them into one very unique experience. In this episode, we will be looking at Dragon Force, discuss why I think it's the best game on the Saturn, and go over some recommendations on how you can play it. I hope you guys enjoy my review of Dragon Force for the Sega Saturn. Development for Dragon Force began in 1994 by a small developer called J-Force. Much of its staff was made of former Wolf Team members, the developer responsible for Sega Genesis games like Granada and Sega CD games like Cobra Command. Things didn't go well, however. J-Force folded while the game was being made, and Sega brought the project in-house to be finished by Sega CS. It was directed by Tomoyuki Ito, who worked on Shinobi 3, the Clockwork Knight series, and eventually Skies of Arcadia. Much of the team from there was comprised of an elite crew that worked on everything from Daytona USA to Shinmu. I think it's important to understand the origins of this game to really appreciate the level of talent involved in its creation. When it was brought west, working designs took on the job of translating it for English markets. They added some shortcuts to the interface, cleaned up some repeated text, and of course it has the trademark sophomoric humor that dominates many of their translations. The story here, of course, is nothing new to these types of games. A big bad evil called Madrick has descended upon the peaceful land of Legendra. As Madrick wages war against its people, the goddess Ostia summons forth the great star dragon Harsgalt to defend Legendra. Along with his eight chosen warriors, they seal Madrick's evil away from the world. The game picks up 300 years later, just as the seal weakens and the dark god's minions begin to work towards his revival. Madrick's apostles quickly cause confusion and aggression between the kingdoms of Legendra, leading to full-scale war. You choose one of eight countries to play from there. There's King Wine of the Highland Kingdom. He's kind of the quintessential good guy with blonde hair and silver armor. There's the Elf Queen Tiris of the Pale Moon Kingdom. She's the love interest of King Wine and a powerful magic user. Emperor Junin is the leader of the Tristan Empire and known as the Black Knight of Death to its enemies. The Topaz Kingdom is led by King Leon, a powerful warrior that believes he can overcome any adversary through his incredible martial might. The Bozak Nation is led by Lord Gongos. This jungle region is inhabited by beastmen who are great at physical combat. Emperor McCall leads the Izumo Nation, a land of samurai and ninja with a great code of honor and self-sacrifice. The final two kingdoms only unlock after defeating the game once. You have King Reinhardt, the leader of Tradnor. He is the most potent magic user in the land and a descendant of the god Valhart. His entire nation is mainly magic wielders. Our final entry is the Emperor Goldark and the main human antagonist of the story. He seizes power from his brother and starts the war that consumes the continent. All these choices change the story a bit and have different details and special appearances by non-playable characters. The goal ultimately remains the same, however. Unite the Dragon Force and stop the rise of Madrick. Suddenly, the sacred dragon Harzgalt lunged forth to 
mock Madruk's advance. Enraged, Madruk turned his fiery ardor to Arsgald. The battle between the holy dragon and the wicked god seemed to be without end. In its wake, the winds howled, the oceans crashed, and the vast land trembled violently. One thousand days passed, and Harsgalt had only enough strength remaining to lock Madruk into a sleep that would keep just long enough for eight chosen heroes to be born. Now, that time is upon us. The final confrontation rushes forth. The gameplay of Dragon Force is at first nearly impossible to describe accurately. You almost have to see it in action to get any real sense of it. The truth is, there are not a lot of games even remotely similar to this. The only one that comes to mind is the Total War series on the PC, but even that's a hell of a stretch. After choosing your leader, you are thrust into a story that explains the continent is about to erupt into full-scale war. Nation against nation as the Apostles of Madrick work to destroy mankind and revive the Dark God. Once you get past the story, you are greeted to the map screen. This is the entire land of Legendra, all of its kingdoms, castles, towns, and places of interest. You have the full run of the map at all times, can click on any castle or unit to see its generals and troops, and of course make any movements you deem appropriate. The only limiting factor is the timer imposed on the map screen. You'll notice that in the upper right hand corner there is an hourglass that dictates this particular round of the map screen. But while you're on the map screen you have an entire army to mobilize and a kingdom to protect. By clicking on one of your castles you can see who is stationed there, you can resupply troops, and you can command units to move to another part of the map. Of course in the beginning you only have a handful of generals and castles, so you'll need to spread out a bit to gain new land and battle your closest enemies. You need to be very aware that while on the map screen, your foes are in constant motion and attacks can come out of nowhere. You'll need to shore up those weak areas in your defense and be sure not to leave your kingdom defenseless in your absence. Once you do engage in battle, it's army against army and general against general. Castles hold up to 10 generals and their armies, but mobile units can only hold up to 5. This means a well-defended castle can be quite difficult to overtake. At the start of the battle, you and your opponent trade taunts and then you have the opportunity to set your troops into formation. These formations are an assortment of offensive and defensive sets that allow you to better prepare for the situation at hand. There are 10 troop types from there. You get soldiers, cavalry, mage, samurai, archers, monks, harpy, beasts, dragons, and zombies. Each has their own strengths and weaknesses and you'll need to consider that in each and every battle. Once your formation is chosen and the battle begins, your troops will follow your commands to attack the other army or the other general directly. Ultimately, the course of the battle is decided by which general falls first. Each of the generals has special moves, which is governed by a power meter and magic points. These special moves range from army crushing magic attacks to the ability to replenish your troops. They can make a general extremely tough to beat. If the two sides should lose all their troops, it goes to a one-on-one -on -one battle between the generals until one of them falls. You do have the option to retreat if you feel it's a battle you can't win. Engaging the enemy gets you experience so you can level up your generals and make them tougher. Which brings us to our final gameplay section, the administration mode. This is where you go when the little hourglass I mentioned earlier runs out. Here is where you control a good portion of your empire's non-battle related options. Domestic leads you into a menu where you control awards, which is just a way to give your generals more troops as they win battles. You also have items, which allows you to equip various types of weapons and accessories per general. You have audience, which allows you to talk to your generals and captives. Generals, which allows you to see all your general stats and where they are on the map. Search, which allows certain generals to search the castles they're in for items and other generals to join your calls. And finally, there's Fortify, which can raise the level of a castle so you can stockpile more troops to replenish your armies. Of these options, Awards, Search for Items, and Audience are the most important. The Search for Items not only yields equipment for your generals, but also items that allow you to command certain troop types. You also want to pay attention to the Audience option, because here you have the ability to recruit enemy generals to your calls. Extra generals will increase your ability to wage war across the map. 
you are free to conquer the various kingdoms as you see fit and rarely does the story get in the way. I adore the way this game looks. You guys know I appreciate 2D graphics and this engine employs just about every special effect you can imagine. It effortlessly scales both the troops and the playfield as you move around the screen. Special moves can put even more sprites into play and certain magics can fill the entire screen with transparencies. When you consider the 100 vs 100 troop battles, the sheer amount going on is nothing short of impressive. At the time, you had never seen a game put that much on your TV without slowdown. It was built for the Saturn. It used the hardware in ways other games did not, and the end result was spectacular. VDP-1 and VDP-2 in perfect harmony. The art of Dragon Force is impressive as well. Troops, generals, battlefields, it all was hand-drawn goodness. Nothing digitized and nothing pre-rendered. It was exactly the kind of 2D that I think would have done well even in a brand new 3D world. Everything had depth, and it was so far above the stuff we saw on the Super Nintendo and Genesis, you couldn't help but be impressed. This remains one of the most visually impressive Saturn games to me. This engine gave me visions of platformers, beat-em-ups, and fighting games using similar effects. We actually saw some games using VDP2 in a similar manner, such as Thunder Force 5. I really wish more games had done so. The better role-playing games tended to have some pretty great soundtracks, and of course so does Dragon Force. The stuff here is burned into my mind because I played it so much. Cool thing is is that it's 100% machine-generated chiptunes. No Red Book audio here. I could go on and on about how much I enjoy it, but here are a few examples to help you better understand. Even though it has a great overall presentation, Dragon Force's gameplay is its greatest asset by far. This is an open world RPG that allows you to play it in any way you want. Not only do you have a choice of many characters to choose from, but you also can choose the troop types you employ in battle, which kingdoms you conquer first, and what generals you recruit to your cause. This allows for an unprecedented amount of customization. By extension, it also allows you full control over the difficulty. If you decide to go with the most powerful troop type, you will run roughshod over the game with next to no issues. But if you choose to have one of the weaker types, the game can become a true challenge. Marching into the temple battles with nothing more than soldiers can be an exercise in pure strategic decision making just to survive. Whereas an army of dragons could basically just plow through a battle without worry, an army made of soldiers would need to be placed on the battlefield more carefully to be effective. And that right there is exactly what made this game so incredible. 
the ability to tune nearly every aspect of its gameplay into something you want it to do. Marching your squad of lovable characters across the map, slowly but surely crushing your foes and taking their land was an experience few games of that generation could ever hope to match. The previously mentioned graphics and sound were icing on the cake and just rounded out the entire package into something really special. Of course, no game is perfect, and Dragon Force does have a few areas that drag it down a bit. There are a few story-triggered sequences that won't allow you to take certain areas early in the game. This is annoying and will set you in a battle loop that forces you to retreat. There are also story sequences that will kick you out of certain castles, and if you have 10 generals in that castle, it will separate them into 10 armies, all of which have to be clicked and redirected. The final story sequence also forces you into the last battle once triggered. It spawns an endless wave of attacks that basically make it so you have no choice but to go meet the last enemy and end the game. In a game with such an incredible amount of freedom, this was a real letdown. Dragon Force can also be too easy, especially if you consult outside help like FAQs or strategy guides. Of course, all of those things are small potatoes next to what the game gets right, and if you give it a chance, I'm sure you'll love it as much as I did. I don't usually do this in my reviews, but I wanted to take a moment and tell you a few points about Dragon Force that may help you enjoy it more. The internet has ruined this game for many people. Experienced players telling how to play, what strategies to employ, and where to get the best items, troops, and generals have had a profound effect on this game's playability. Self-discovery is an absolute must for this one. If you go looking for information on the castles that hold the Dragon Crest and pimp your entire army out with nothing but dragons, the difficulty of this game basically goes to nothing. You'll march the map clear in no time, crush the bad guy at the end, and your entire experience was lesser for it. There is also a strategy that came out many years ago that recommends you pause the game after your battles, redeploy your troops, and then crush the retreating enemy. This is an exploit and not how the game was meant to be played. If you want the most from Dragon Force, don't use it, because it again makes the game incredibly easy. Dragon Force is best played without knowing where everything is and by learning the ins and outs on your own. My first time through, I had no idea where the Dragon Troops could be gotten, nor did I realize you could basically capture every enemy the first try with the Pauls exploit. I worked my way slowly across the map with the troops I already had, or found by chance, and fell in love with exactly how it was intended to be played. For you high-level guys that know everything about Dragon Force already, try beating the game with nothing but your default troops. It really adds some much-needed challenge and honestly makes for a better playing game on top of it. Those troop formations go from an afterthought to helping you survive, and you'll start paying much closer attention to things like terrain effect. It also makes the characters you choose at the beginning mean so much more. Some of the monarchs have troops you succeed with easily, while others have troops you'll fight tooth and nail for every victory. When I say the challenge of Dragon Force is directly controlled by you, I mean it, and how you choose to approach this one makes one heck of a difference.
The Sega Saturn is my favorite gaming system. It has so many games I consider to be the best of that generation, so when I tell you that Dragon Force is my favorite game on it, I want you to know that's no small thing, nor do I say it lightly. I really did love just about everything this game stood for. The choice, the customization, the replay value, it was all on a level that just blew me away. That excellent gameplay was also accompanied by a graphics engine that was just pure 32-bit 2D goodness. It's one of the few games I honestly believe neither the PlayStation or Neo Geo could have reproduced accurately or at the same level of finesse. 200 troops, two generals, full-screen magic attacks, transparencies, smooth full-screen scaling. I mean, this is the kind of 2D graphics that looked so good it easily stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with any of that newfangled polygon stuff because no home system had previously been capable of it. What you are left with is a game that is simply like no other. A game that was Saturn exclusive for years and represented the RPG genre in new and exciting ways. Dragon Force was very popular in Japan, where it spawned a sequel called Dragon Force 2. It was developed by Chime, who made a number of changes to the battle system and troop types. It too was a fine game and well worth playing now that it has an English translation out there. I still prefer the first Dragon Force, however, and I think if you go into it willing to tackle the game on your own terms and at your own pace, you will find a game very much worth your time. Even if it doesn't end up being your very favorite Saturn game, I think many of you will still agree, it definitely made the Saturn library a lot more enjoyable. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.